Hello, Yeshua Network, and welcome to the entire Bible read-through, Matthew Woo! 20 through 21. We're back. Indeed, we are. You guys, I hope you're having an absolutely wonderful night. Uh, for those of you who are on the 40-Day Holiness Challenge as well, just thank you guys for participating in that and joining the new group. If you guys haven't joined the group, the group is... Uh, Facebook.com groups forward slash groups with an S forward slash 40 DHC. So if you guys haven't been there yet and you're watching this video series and you've been coming along and you haven't participated in that, I encourage you to do so. Uh, we're doing it again. And uh, yeah, really, really blessed by it. So thank you guys for uh, all that as well. And thank you for the comments you left this week. Uh, glad that we took the time to let everybody leave some more comments because these passages are amazing and I'd hate to uh, to rush it as we have been doing, keeping it chill. Uh, and I will be doing an update as well about the future meetup that I had mentioned about a week ago. Uh, I do have some updates on that and uh, some questions to ask you guys regarding it. So we will be talking about that more as well. Anyway, so yeah, should we uh, just jump right on in? I can't think, is there anything else? Oh, hashtag be the light coming up. What? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. So, you know, look forward to your pictures and postings on that as well. Tomorrow in the group chat, the group chatty, chatty timeline thing. So there you go. All right. I think I uh, can't think of anything else at the time. Oh, of course. Oh, I've been, I'm supposed to do this every video and I forget. Uh at the top of the Yeshua official page on Facebook, there is a link. And on that link are all like the videos and there is like a page you can go to. And it has all the content and the resources and downloads and all sorts of things. Uh, brothers and sisters have worked together a lot of hours to bring you that tool. And so I highly recommend you guys go there and check that out, especially if you're watching this on YouTube. You will be blessed by all the resources that they've been able to put together and continue to put together for us. So go check that out as well. So thank you also, brothers and sisters, who do that for us. All right. Those are the kickoff announcements by everybody is logging on. And welcome to another and Be the Light. Woohoo! I mean, uh, I can't even think straight, bro. I'm so pumped right now. I'm like... <laughs> I'm giddy with the Holy Spirit. We always pray before we start the videos. And the truth of the matter is, is like the Holy Ghost just hits so hard. And you're just like, ay, 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 ay. <laughs> Hallelujah. So anyways, good, good day. Good fellowship. Blessed to be here with you guys. Hallelujah. Um, Ricardo, I uh, don't know if I copied that one. If you don't, I can't really get to that other page now because I'm in the video page. So if you don't mind. Post it here. Uh. Well, if you yeah, if you don't mind uh, pasting it here, yeah, yeah, um, I will. We will add add it and definitely read it. Um, okay, so uh, last week we we finished off nineteen and we touched on twenty because uh, that was the plan, but we we did stop a little short because it seemed like uh, there were many more comments to be made about twenty, and it looks like we were not wrong about that. Many more comments have been made, so we'll just go ahead and jump into them. Yes? Yes. Here we go. Um, Mary Rainey says, Matthew 20, 1 through 16, parable of the laborers. laborers of the, um, uh, I'm um, not the only one. Um, yes. See? Uh, blah, blah. Oblique, oblique, oblique. Take 74. Uh, parable of the laborers of the vineyard. <laughs> Who are the first middle who are the first middle and last laborers? That's a difficult word. Laborers. Symbolically. I would assume that the first set of laborers, <clears throat> the ones who are hired early in the morning, are the Jews. These were the first servants who became a light to the nations. However, there are several crews of other servants who get hired at different hours during the middle of the day and some at the third hour of the day, some at the sixth hour and some at the ninth hour, which I can only guess to be various generations of Gentile believers throughout the last 2,000 years since the time of Messiah. However, there are some hired in the 11th hour of the day, one hour before closing time. I'm just wondering if this is a special or different group of people. I tried researching this topic but I couldn't come up with any solid answer. 
My initial thoughts were possibly that they were one of the these three different groups of people. One, they are the last generation of Gentile believers living right before Christ's second coming when he comes to reap the harvest, or perhaps they were non-believers who became last-minute believers during the tribulation period who refused to take the mark of the beast. Two, they are the same large group of people described in Matthew 22.10 who were invited to a king's wedding feast. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they had found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. These were not the original guests invited. The king's original guests snubbed him and wouldn't attend the wedding, so he invited some random strangers. And three, they are the remnant of Israel which turns back to believe in the Messiah in the last days. All of the servants received the same reward, which I assume to be salvation. Some of them worked harder for it than others, i.e. Jews had to obey over 600 laws and when Talmudic traditions, and then Talmudic traditions on top of that all. Gentiles had less of a burden towards the law according to the apostles, Acts 15.29. Notwithstanding Yeshua's commandments, only four of the Jewish laws applied to the Gentiles according to the consensus of the apostles, abstained from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Even the requirement for some of these things seemed questionable later on when you consider 1 Corinthians 8, which goes into conscience issues. So with this progression, it makes me wonder if there is a greater grace coming to the very last group. This is all speculation, and I'm interested in hearing if anyone else has some thoughts on this passage. Well, Mary, that is a great, great thought-provoking comment. Indubitably. Indubitably. So there, so do you have comments on that? I, so I do want to say, Mary, you did such a great job, but because there's other comments from other people, I'm going to hold off until we finish them all on this particular part. Do you have anything you want to... I will do I just, the same. No, I will do the same as you. I, I think it's a great conversation. Uh, okay. Hold on, Ricardo. I'm getting his post. Yeah. Um, so you go ahead and read because he's next. Well, real quick. Yeah, I'll read his next one. But Mary, I just want to say, too, that I think um, I'm really I'm really blessed that you took the time to really share your thoughts and like your experience of reading these scriptures, because this is the type of like fellowship that i think is really important this is i'm just so boxing on with gratitude right now that this is the type of thing that we've come to do because i think this is so rare that you know i feel that in religion or just at least christianity maybe even judaism and stuff is that there's it feels like you always have to have the answer you know and it's almost like you're always being tested like is this the right thing and then there's somebody at the head of the church or somebody who's head of the denomination and they go oh you got the right answer or yes that's the right answer that's what we believe and if you don't believe that it's like you're not with them and i think the wonderful thing about what you've done here is you're saying i see a variety of possibilities and you know we're only on matthew which is great so I just think that this is so healthy, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I know I've talked about this before, but I just want to, I want to praise the Lord for what he has brought us as a fellowship to do and record this whole thing for people who I know for a fact, because they text me or email me all the time and say, Hey, I'm trying to catch up to you guys. And I'm like, well, the good news is, is in the new Testament, we're going real slow to the very good chance you're going to catch up to us. And there's a lot of people really excited about that. And um, so we're going to read the other comments and I know they're going to be like this and they have been like this, but I just, I, I like the idea and I want to highlight this because I want to encourage other people to, to leave comments like you did, Mary, in that you don't always have to be like, here, I found the answer unequivocally, undoubtedly, this is that, this is my conclusion, this is what I'm persuaded of. I think it's an amazingly healthy uh, and, and blessed thing to say, I don't know, but here's what I'm seeing. Is there anything I'm not seeing? And is there a way for us to come to a conclusion uh, to know for sure? I think that that I think that I want to get I, I have multiple thoughts in my head and I apologize, but I really want to let everybody know who's watching this series. 
participating in this series. You don't always have to have like the ability to say, I've come up with the, the final answer. You know, um, I really want to encourage you guys to say, this is what I see and, uh, and I don't know. Uh, and then let's talk about it and let's all bring our little bits and pieces to the table, you know, just like a puzzle. And the more of the puzzle pieces we have, there's a very good chance we might see what we're looking at. So I just wanted to encourage that specific behavior uh, because I really think that that was a really wonderful thing. So Ricardo, Matthew 20, 1 through 16, the labors in the vineyard. Sorry. Sorry about the... Why Sorry do I have to always the... burp right when I start to talk? What? what happened? No, I was floating around the screen. It, uh, I'm trying to, this, this is a phone that's not mine. It's, it's going off and I'm trying to turn it off. Oh, okay. Yeah. Matthew 21 through 16. The first thing that called my attention is the word vineyard because Yeshua stated that he is the true vine and we the branches. The second thing called my attention was I told you last week, this made me think about Hebrews that had been around for years and years and how they probably feel about the Gentiles coming to them. The phrase that laborers said and moved me to the, to the most is these last have wrought but one hour and now has, and now has made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. This they said reminded me to the parable of the lost son when the lost son that did not, uh, left complains pretty much similar. And oh, yeah, because the son that didn't leave complains like, oh, you're celebrating you're, the prodigal son is the story. And answering, he said to his father, lo, these many years I have served you. Neither did I transgress your commandments at any time. And yet you never gave me a kid, a goat, uh, so that I might make merry with my friends. But when his son of yours came, who has devoured your living uh, devoured your living with harlots and you have killed for him the fattened calf. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. And we lost and is found. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely, definitely thought about that parable as well, Ricardo. And I definitely see the correlations and the similarities and the message seems to be definitely repeating as the Lord does in the scripture. Amen. Um, Sarah says, really great commentary, Mary. Totally didn't think about this text in these ways. Very thought provoking. See, Jared says the first be last and the last be first. Exactly. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, just the uh, common Ricardo just uh, did in lifetime. There's a P here's a PS from the parable of the laborers of the vineyard. Oh, okay. Uh, walking dogs this morning and thinking about this, some things came to my mind. Let me know what your thoughts are. Every one of the laborers gets the same salary, one denarius. If the reward is the same, never fails. People calling me right now. <laughs> like clockwork. Like clockwork. It's so funny, guys. It's hilarious. Somebody calls Alex every single video since we started this. Yeah. Right, like 30 yeah. minutes in. It's so funny. It's like All right. <laughs> walking dogs this morning and thinking about this. Some things came to my mind. Let me know what your thoughts. Every one of the laborers gets the same salary, one denarius. If the reward is the same, could it be that one denarius is an analogy for salvation, everlasting life? I mean, Salvation is the same for everyone, right? Second thing, the sentence for many be called but few chosen. I've been reading this sentence as this. Many are called, but among those who have been called, there are only a few that will get it and make it. Now, reading all this in context, it feels different. The parable actually begins in Matthew 19, 27, when Peter said and asked, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Yeshua replies before telling this parable about the regeneration, about receiving a hundredfold and inheriting an everlasting life. And then the parable about how the kingdom of heaven is like. Bear with me, hope it makes sense. If there is need of workers, means there is a task to complete. If there is need of more workers every three hours, it means that there are phases of in the whole task and or that there is there, that there are too much work and not enough workers. And each of this group of workers was called in a specific time, as many were called along the Bible, and many more, ha and many more all already mentioned in prophecies, 
that had not occurred yet to be a part of our father's history. Maybe this means that only a few will make it, but now I'm reading this as many are called as the Bible does in fact say, those who are called and those and those who will be called, but few are chosen for a specific task in a specific time of history, whether it is at the very beginning or at the very end, the first or the last, that this, does this make sense? Uh, I love, Ricardo, what you did there and where this took you, because what I'm discovering about our journey through Matthew right now, in, our, in the entire Bible read-through, that all those things that strike fear about rejection and not making it are so much of it is like we're almost looking at it with the wrong eyes when we look at it that way and that the lord is trying to what you are trying what you are seeing or feeling or or, or perceiving in these passages that way it's not about those who don't make it it's not about rejection it's actually a uh uh uh, something else. <laughs> and so I just want to say, Ricardo, that I love that that's happening and, um, and I'm still getting called. So I'll go ahead and, and throw it on to you, Nathan. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, a few, a few live comments too. Um, uh, Christina says many are called and few are chosen could be interpreted as they are few whom Yahweh actually chooses ahead of time, like John the Baptist for a specific task. Yeah. So it's almost like there's specialists who he has to go and he seeks to do a specific job. I could see that as well. I thought about that as well. Um, Sarah Peterson is the next con No, Susan Davis is the next comment. Don't want to skip anybody. There. Um, and it's the same, same, scripture so let's see her comment she says um i think the message here is to not be concerned with or envious of others blessings or reward the lord keeps his promise and there is no favoritism he is fair and just and does not waver he is paying them according to what they agreed to what they wanted also see this as putting the first card last putting the first card first last and the last verse as to give humility to the first because they know they are first they expect to be first they believe they are better than the ones who come last yeah yeah um more scriptures on this so i'm still i'm still <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah mary says oh uh, Marie says, oh, my little heart, he is so good. He sure is. He, he really is. He's unbelievably he really is. good. It's so unbelievably awesome how good he is. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love Yeshua. I don't know if you guys knew that, but like, I'm just going to share it with you right now. I'm just, I love Yeshua. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you want to read Sarah Peterson? Yes. Do you want me to read it since you had long? Okay, you good? Uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm good to go. Uh, Sarah Peterson, Matthew 20, verses 8 and 16. I noticed that in the parable, those who showed up last were paid first, and those who showed up first were paid last. Then in verse 16, Yeshua reiterates, so the last will be first and the first will be last. I think in the past, I've always thought about this phrase, meaning literally that those who are held in high honor on earth will be held in low honor in heaven and vice versa. But I'm realizing now in reading this story that all workers are paid the same. The reward is equal, so everyone is seen as equal in the eyes of Jehovah. So... Yeshua is saying the first will be last and the last will be first. That he means here is really to see each other as equals. None of us are more or less deserving of any reward. This encourages unity, not competition. Even competition of being the least or most humble doesn't make sense if your motivation is to therefore be considered greater than everyone else in the kingdom. This concept is reiterated by Yeshua's response to the mother of the sons of Zebedee. In, the verse, in verses 26 and 28, when he encourages his disciples to serve others instead of lording over everyone. I've noticed that when I shift my attitude and behavior towards serving others, it changes my heart. And I'm not thinking about getting a greater reward than the people I'm serving. But when I live my life expecting to be served, I start to get an attitude of thinking I deserve more than others. I think Yeshua knew that when he was encouraging his disciples to serve others, their hearts would change and they wouldn't be focused on their reward anymore, which is exactly what he wants from our hearts. Not to be serving with the motivation of being considered better than others, but to truly know that we are equals when we consider others better than ourselves. 
it made me realize how obedience and actually doing what Yeshua commands, it made me realize how obedience and actually doing what Yeshua commands instead of just hearing it is what truly changes our hearts. Well, I mean, find me a mic so I can drop it right now. <laughs> You guys are smashing it out of the park. Yeah, awesome. It's really beautiful. These are beautiful, awesome. beautiful comments and conversation. Yeah. So that was the last one uh, in regards to the parable of yes. the uh, the vineyard owner. Um, yes. You got anything you want to kind of just throw in? Well, I'm just the... super pumped by it all. Yeah. I'm super pumped yeah. by what you guys are seeing and saying. And it takes me back also to the things we've been discovering lately in Matthew about you know, uh, when we when we even look back in the Old Testament and consider the promises made to Israel, it tells you right there, and it, it's reiterated again, all will get the same reward. Those under the sun who are laboring, who are, who are cranky at the end of the day, <laughs> um, it, you know, it describes, in my opinion, it describes the Israelites pretty good. But at the end of the day, all rewards are the same, which means that... Um, um, well, it, it, it means, it, when it talks about the last being the first, um, I think it also, you know, I, I feel those in Yeshua who have received the Holy Spirit or received the Holy Spirit and, and fuller and fuller are experiencing the kingdom of heaven in the here and now, on the earth now. It's almost like being the first, even though they're way later in the whole deal, right? I just I feel like all of these parables, these about the first, the last, and the last, the first, that it it is just universally applicable to all of the all of the uh, people we've encountered in the Book of Remembrance, to all of the uh, uh, different believers, different tribes of people who have come to God. I, I feel I feel like it applies to each one individually, one of us. I don't know. It's it's like there is nothing inconsistent at all about this parable. And I agree with um, Sarah, what you're pointing out about what it's really saying to how we must perceive our attitude and how we must change our focus. And then and then it becomes super clear about what this parable is about. So I think that's that's my two cents about that. I am in love with this whole thing because like, can you guys hear me? Okay. Cause I put my earpiece in. I you sound fine. Super good. Okay. I am. Um, I'm in love with this whole thing because this is a interesting concept that I was persuaded of that, that somebody said it and I forget who it was. Sorry. It might be comments back. I'm I'm under the personal persuasion, and maybe it was M M Mary in her the last generation Gentiles believe. So I, I think this has like so many layers and so many applications. Um, I love all the positive comments coming in. I love all the hearts. I love all the rejoicing over Yeshua and His good word and how this is good news. I, I love that people are feeling like, wow, I'm not less than those who are in the Bible or came before me. I'm not, you know, um, the Lord receives me with equal love, like he cherishes me equally, even though I may not be as good as somebody else. I may not be as, as holy rolling as somebody else. Uh, I love to see the response. And I know that the people watching this video, so that's why I want to make sure that I highlight that so that people might be feeling that when they're watching this recorded. And, uh, and I want you guys to know that like that's happening live as well. And um, I think this has so many layers. I think for sure this is, this is, Yeshua is giving a foundation to something. There's there's going to be more about this specific topic to come. And, and, and we're going to learn that not everybody is the same. And Ricardo brought up a really good parable, which is there was a son who worked for his father, did everything that he thought was right and could do. And his father just didn't feel like he... 
he didn't, the son didn't feel like his father recognized him. And then he throws this like big parade in this party for the son that went around like whoring around and squandered literally half of the father's earned, you know, wealth. And what did the father give him? He gave him the most beautiful calf. He gave him the fattened calf. He threw him a party, right? Like what did that cost the father, right? To celebrate his, like in, in the scale of things, like nothing really, but it was it was so well prized by the other son. And and I think that these all tie together. I, I, and I, that's why I love all this. I, I think it is the Jews. I think that the 11th hour here's an here's an interesting thing that nobody talked about that I wanted to throw in. Once we get to the book of Revelation, it says that in the end times, it will be more horrific and there will be more torture and there will be more pain than any other generation has ever experienced or ever will experience again. And so I'm thinking to myself, like the Lord has done this balance thing, right? Like, like even though the world were later, we have the scriptures, we have testimony, we have video cameras that record miracles we have you know the ability to talk to people over the internet i mean being a minister they used to have to wear flip-flops and go around with manure on the freaking driveways and the or the walkways or the pathways of the roads and stepping in poop and like urine and like then they would go into people's houses there weren't showers there was no such thing as you know deodorant like do you get what i'm trying to say like it, it balances out but we also have more temptation today readily available in our hands than any generation has ever had we have we have the ability to slide into darkness quicker and faster than any other generation and be consumed by it you know in a different type of way so what i'm trying to say is is that like i i don't perceive that it's uneven and i i don't perceive that that the lord uh is necessarily giving favoritism and i and i and i love the question about you know the john john the baptist like he was obviously a actual really chosen person so was david so was moses they were they were literally plucked out of all humans on earth and said you're going to perform this specific task i do think that when you use the word chosen that that application can indeed be applicable but in, in this also, the fact that you make into heaven, I think the word chosen is another form of humbling, that it's not something that we get to be like, I did this, like I deserve to be here. And this is something you hear me talk about on the live Q&As all the time. Like who of us can stand before the Lord and go through the checklist and say, well, I've done everything. Let me in. Like who could talk to Yeshua, our judge who sits on the white throne or the marriage throne? Who could talk to him like that and say, I, I did it, let me in, right? And, and there's a couple people in these passages, these last few chapters, that, that kind of almost approach him like that, going, um, go ahead, show me what I've done wrong. Go ahead, my, my two sons are great, and they can do whatever you, know, you want them to do, and they will be great in your kingdom, but you need to you know, put them on the right hand, left hand, or what about me, Lord? And he says, sell everything. My, my point is to say is that, I do think that the leveling of the playing field is a very good tool for us to remain humble ourselves in our day and age. We might feel smarter. We might feel like we know more. We might feel like it's totally ridiculous that the people who are wandering in the desert for 40 days, you know, or 40 years, we're seeing a pillar of fire and a cloud. And, they, and we're thinking to ourselves, like, why were they griping? They literally had a manifestation of God with them. Right. But, but we have, those thousands of years and the totality of the knowledge we have yeshua's words and we have the holy spirit living in us which they had in a tent that one person could interact with you know and it's just like there's this balance and so i i just wanted to point this out because i think that i, I i'm not trying to put a rain on the parade i, I love the parade i want to glorify the parade but if we should read in later scriptures, if we should, that when we get to paradise, eternity with the Lord, that there are hierarchies, that there's a ranking system. And there are some people who sit at the right hand and sit at the left hand of Yeshua. And there's some people who are all the way back at the end of, of uh, 
you know, of the crowd, right? They're sitting in the all the way in the back. You know, I make a joke, but it's really not funny. And me and Alex, I know I joke with Alex a lot about this, is if I'm in heaven and I'm on a street corner banging pots together and like that's my reality, I'm just like, adar, adar, and I'm just banging pots together, but I'm in paradise. Like I've won. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm with my Lord in, in that place. Like, like I just think that that if our heart is in the right place, which again, the conversation tonight was being brought up about, if a heart is in the right place, and this is important, this is kind of my final, just kind of bringing this all together. If our heart is in the right place, we have won because we do have Yeshua. We have won because we made it into paradise for eternity with him. That is indeed the victory. If there is a crown or an honoring that we get, Hallelujah. Praise be to Yeshua, because in all reality, it's for his glory anyways. Now, I say all this and I point out this point is when you think about the prodigal son story, which I'm really glad that Ricardo brought up because I won't, I was hoping somebody would. What if the brother was equally as happy to have the other brother return as the father was? And I think that that's the thing that we're not getting. I think that we don't have, like, I think that we're so worried about us. And it, even in our spiritual mindset, we're still, as you guys have heard me call it many a times, self-preservation mode, right? What do I have to do to get to heaven? What do I have to do to store up heavenly treasures? What do I mean this, Yeshua, me and Yeshua, my and Yeshua, right? I, I, and, and I'm going to point out just a thing. Whether you retain this, whether you whether you hold on to this as we continue to read, I think that as as we continue into the New Testament, you're going to hear this underlining theme uh, that Yeshua's saying, "I don't just want you to understand how to get in. I want you to understand that I need you to now turn around and go grab others." I need you to become my partner with building my kingdom rather than somebody who's just continually trying to get as close to my throne as possible. And, and I think that Christianity just, there's, there's, and it's human nature. I'm not judging anybody. I just think that there is this human nature, even in holiness and even in walking with Christ, where we really can slip up and get caught what I call the slippery slope. And that is that we, we, we strive towards, achieving things that again it's a checklist well look what i did yeshua look at how good i am and we see that in scriptures like this is so amazing that we're seeing all this in scriptures right here he is the messiah he's finally arrived i'm still boxing i he i what happens whatever so he's arrived they're calling him son of david they're acknowledging he's messiah he's calling himself son of adam right so he's totally like i don't think that anybody is curious of who he is so much so and i know i don't think anybody pointed this out and it might be in the next scripture i don't want to get ahead of myself the blind men that's not coming up right okay so there is something mentioned that's going to be confirmed obviously in the next chapter but i just think that that when we as believers actually understand why yeshua says i just want you home with me the reason why he would give a fat calf for the son that blew half of the inheritance is because now he's with him and now he can help make the entire situation better. And the more that come, just like the wedding ceremony, the whole situation is better. And, and if you think about the wealth of Yeshua, you think about the wealth of Jehovah, he doesn't run out of wealth. Like there's nowhere in the story where it tells us that the vineyard was finished. There's nowhere in the story where it tells us that like everybody filled the vineyard and, you know, there was no more room for anybody. And he actually stopped people from coming, you know, and, and it, he even had to go to some, some, I guess, as it, as it was kind of written, like some shadier characters at the end time, at the very final hour to let him in. So all the work could get done. And, and there's another thing that, that, that I, I'm going to skip ahead for a split second here, I guess. When he talks about how maybe I'll wait. Yeah. 
Okay, so it's just so so much good stuff. I hope I hope you guys are getting on. I can't see the comments, Alex. It looked like you caught something you wanted to read, though. I won't stop. Uh, no, no, not necessarily. I mean, there's a lot of comments. I'm try I was trying to keep track. It's it's a lot, a lot of comments coming in. Uh, I just while you were talking and and mentioning what you were mentioning, it made me think more about the, you know, the actual situation. Imagine the actual situation that, uh, you know, there's uh, everybody out there is looking at looking for it to be easy everybody that's a normal human thing i just get me what i need i want to hand out whatever i can get as easy as i can get it and a call goes out hey there's some work to be done and some laborers show up at the market and are willing to work and yeah. then three hours later more people show up at the market willing to work three yeah. hours later more people show up at the market willing to work None of them who are showing up at the market willing to work are doing it because they know, oh, there's only three hours left in the day. We're going to get paid as much right. as the guys that were there first. So, yeah. yeah, if that's their attitude, they're not showing up to work. Right. They're going to show up. They would to, say, I'll wait tomorrow. I'll Sorry, wait till tomorrow. Ahead. Exactly. They're, they're right. not the types who are going to show up and be willing to work. The, the vineyard owner grabs only those who are showing up willing to to work now it just so happens the day ends at, you know at the 12th hour and everybody because they were willing and because they did work receives the pay so that's another thing that i just you know made me think of the fact that this is not weird because if you were one of the laborers and you were literally hanging out go no i'm not going with the first group no they're gonna work all day i'm not doing that no i'm not going with the second group they're going to work most of the day. I'm not doing that. Okay, I'll go with the last group. Actually, if you realized that the only job to be had is right here with this vineyard owner, you'd be risking not getting called at all. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's really exactly like not. they realize there's a call and they go to work. They didn't do anything wrong. They weren't they weren't machinate, you know, they're trying to scheme of how to game right. the system and yeah. get more money for less work. Yeah. So so that's how it's fair. I, I think it is. I, 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 I'm, and even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't, like who's going to complain about the result? What if you are in the back of the crowd sitting on a street corner in heaven banging pots together for all eternity? Like what if? Like who's, who's complaining about that, right? Like it, it just, if, you, if your brain, if you, if you stock your thoughts, right? If you stock your thoughts and you are honest with yourself and you think to yourself, no, I'm not happy with that. You have two you have two options. You either change your mindset or you go and you do something about it, right? And Yeshua is very clear about what that thing is in order to be, you know, greater in heaven. Be a servant unto others. Don't lord over people. Don't be. Don't try to get people to recognize you. Be a servant. The more servant you are, the the greater your reward in heaven. So there is there is a variant, but it's. It, it's just, uh, it, I think it's more of a mindset and that, that there's so much more I wanted to say, but I'm going to hold off because I know we're going to reach it, especially in 21. We're going to come back to these thoughts. And and I don't know if anything I added helped anybody or just put it in a little bit clearer perspective, but I just think like it's everything that everybody says. And I think I saw a few other people saying, you know, I, I didn't think about it this way. I see people live in the comments saying, you know, I, I see I see all these type of things now. And I think it's all the above. So my recap is, I think that it, he does mean the Jews and the fact that they labored in the hardship. They were the first, right? I do think that the Gentiles have definitely been a stumbling block onto the Jews. Oh, you're, you're in a relationship with our Messiah? Like you even know who the Messiah is? Uh, you don't even know our holidays or what his name is. And you're saying he's your God, right? And, and so you're not the one who works on the property all the time. You haven't been living on the vineyard with them you don't know him but he just is going to reward you the same as the rest of us like i do think that that's totally applicable but i also think that it's also applicable in in individuals i think it's totally you know there's a person who's been a believer their whole life and then there's a person who might be 90 years old and a priest comes in on their deathbed and says the right word at the right time and it speaks to their heart and they actually have a real receiving of Yeshua and salvation. And we're like, wait a second, I gave my whole life 
to it and this guy's getting in or this gal's getting in when they receive Yeshua at their final, you know, deathbed, final, you know, kind of moment. I think it applies in all of these things. Um, and so I think that the wonderful thing is, is that it seems to me that the Lord put down these kind of rules in the contract. As I said, whenever he speaks, it's cosmic law, right? So he's always speaking legal. He's speaking legal doc doctrine. And, um, and the thing I think that's interesting is that we can never argue it and we can never fight it. And the thing that sticks out to me so much, and I might be repeating myself, but hopefully it's, it's just, it's, I feel it's such a game changer when this really sinks in. If we stop continually seeking to gain from the Lord and really the light bulb goes on and goes, I already got it. I got the job. I understand the salvation. I am saved. That guy over there, Yeshua, is my savior. That God of Jehovah of the Jews is my God. Now you became somebody who has the ability to do something you've never, ever done, been able to do before in your life. You've actually been able to become a worker of the creator of the universe's eternal kingdom. And like once that light bulb really goes on, that's when you realize that Yeshua has bestowed upon you in your chosen, in the fact that you were in the town and he said, do you wanna? And you said, I would wanna. The, because he did that, the skill that he gives every single believer is the same. He's, and, and I think it was Jennifer Connelly or somebody said, or maybe it was uh, uh, Sarah, somebody said, uh, I can't remember who it was, so forgive me ladies, who, I think it was a woman though, who said, he's he's the vine and we're the branches right so we're pruning we're 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 clipping the the grapes the fruit off the vine for the for the master that's the gift like do, you, do is this light bulb going on it's not that you got chosen for the job it's that he bestowed upon you a skill you would not have had otherwise he bestowed upon you a success rate that is guaranteed. There's so much grape. There is so much wine to be pressed. There is so much abundance. I'm going out and I'm reaching out to strangers and I'm saying, do you want to take what I'm going to give you, which is an eternal skill, an eternal blessing ability? Do you want to go out and bring in lost souls onto the very creator of the universe? When this light bulb goes on, it's like you no longer have any more time or effort or energy to sit there and go, well, I wonder what my position's going to be. I wonder how close on the throne I'm going to get. I wonder, you know, how I'm going to get recognized or what crown I'm going to be wearing. Like you don't even have time for that because you realize that the actual greatest gift that comes second after just knowing him and being saved, being invited to his house is that he has actually bestowed upon you his, his everything. And we're going to learn about what that everything is. And that's what the second, the first, the son that didn't squander everything. The father specifically says, you've always been with me. You have all that I have. Right? So it's like, we're, we're both sons. We've squandered our lives at some point. But then when we return on to him, he says, now I'm bestowing upon you everything that I have. The difference is, and he said it in the, in, in the parable, he says, Who do, who's done the Lord right? We're, we're going to get to it. I'm going ahead. Who's done the Lord's will? The one who said, I don't want to walk with the Lord, but then ended up walking with the Lord. Or the one who says, yes, I want to walk with the Lord and then didn't. He says, which one is the one who did the will of the Lord? Right. And so so this is this is just my point is it's like we can stop at the whole getting in and being chosen for the workload or we can we can move our brains beyond ourselves and realize that we have been bestowed with with literally God power, God gift, God anointing, God authority to go to the vine, which he is and clip off the fruits which he grew 
right? Do, do you see that? I hope I'm making sense and I'm going to stop there, but it's so much more than the, I chose you at the market and here's your denarius, right? Or your coin or your penny or whatever word you want to call it, right? Like it's not, that's so like first level. And as we continue to read the scripture, I'm repeating myself, but just again, as we continue to read the scripture, he's going to actually get a little frustrated with the apostles because they don't understand that they're stuck in the, well, who's getting the biggest penny at the end of the day? Like whose penny is going to be shinier? And he's like, you don't understand. It's not about the penny at all. It's about the grapes, right? And, 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 and maybe this will speak to somebody, but think of it as a businessman. If one person even comes in at the last hour, and let's just say one batch of grapes is worth one penny, and that person goes and can cut 20, 40, 50 heads of grapes off the vine, right? It took the wealth of one head to pay that person to go get 50 more heads of grapes, Right. And I don't even know what it's called. I'm a bunch, a, a bundle, whatever you want to call it. Right. But like as a businessman, he's a genius. He, it, it makes total sense. Right. Go get one more person to work one more hour because you're going to get 20 more heads of grapes from them. And when you see that this analogy is about souls, when you see that it's about other souls, more souls, the Bible will tell us as we move forward. And these, these are the things that I think are important and okay to kind of let the cat out of the bag and we're going to get to it. But these are the type of things that I think are really important to highlight is that none of us are going to stand in heaven and have our life played back of how we served the Lord. Uh, this is after we're in paradise, not when we're getting in, right? We're always thinking about getting in. Okay, imagine now you're inside. And you're looking around at all your brothers and all your sisters, and maybe some of them came after you, right? And you can say that the Lord allowed you to be the wine dresser, the vine dresser, the one who, who, who did what was he was or she was given and bestowed upon so that that person could have that experience with their creator and the Lord allowed you to be used so they could be there. Who among us is going to be sitting there being like, uh, I, what I, uh, I was here for, and then now what you don't realize is they're your reward, right? And this is the mindset as we move forward in the scripture, you're going to be, you're going to be seeing Yeshua's fighting with their minds to try to really get them to understand this. And then as we get into the letters of the apostles, you'll see it start to sink in and they change their mindset and they grow into this holiness and into this power that he says they will have. And, 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 and this, to me, this is my humble opinion. This is, to me, where things switch. We go from the, the I need to get in, to realizing, like, I'm already in. I'm going to go work for my master as good as I can. And not everybody, I perceive not everybody gets past that switch. Not everybody gets there. But that's where, that's where scripture comes truly to life. So that was what I just wanted to comment on. So, so box on, I'll try not to speak much longer for everything else in the video today. So go ahead, Alex. I'm going to let you read probably a couple to balance that, that speech out. Um, yeah. I, there's some fun things happening tonight in the comments and I'm trying to follow them. Um, uh, I, I see some new people that I, I'm not sure if they've been with us at all or if they're this is their first time seeing uh, the entire Bible read through and maybe they don't know how this goes. Um, but just to reiterate, if you happen to be one of those people, we welcome you. Uh, the entire Bible read through started at the beginning about four years ago, and we've been going from the very beginning, Genesis 1 1, and now we're here in Matthew, and basically every week or so. There's some chapters discussed, and in the in the New Testament so far, we've been really slow. It's been pretty much one chapter a week. And uh, one of the main points in it is we are, the main point of the fellowship is that folks are allowed in real time to share their thoughts and feelings about what's going on as they read the scripture. It's not necessarily about jumping ahead and having all the answers for all the questions that might come up. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes we do go ahead because the questions just really just it's just the perfect time to talk about it. But we try not to. We try to keep it in the context of the particular chapter we're looking at. So if you happen to be a new person and you don't understand what's going on here and, and maybe it looks to you like people aren't giving the right answer that you expect to hear, 
uh, just know that there may be a reason for that. Uh, maybe your right answer isn't right. Uh, or if it is right and you're convinced you have the right answer, uh, I think it would be good for you to go ahead and comment so we can read your answer and we can consider what you're saying and you can enlighten and enrich the conversation and help help all of us understand better because that's what a fellowship is. A fellowship, yeah, no, no. This, this is not a teaching. This is not, we don't come here and soapbox to you or anyone else about what is right Even or about, well, well, <laughs> about what is right or what the Bible says. Right, right, right. We get, when, when, they, when my brother says I'm soapboxing, it really just means he's taking an extra bit of time to give us his perspective. It doesn't mean he's taking an extra bit of time to drill into anybody's mind the right answer. And I think and you've I'm proven not. that time and time again. And so, and that's one of the things we do is when we get a little long winded, we start apologizing because we don't mean to do that. We just get excited because we love the Bible and we love what's happening here. So again, if you happen to be a new person with a piece of information you'd love to share, go ahead and post it. If you just want to kind of come in and, and feel superior to everybody, and you want to tell everybody that they don't know what they're talking about, well, maybe this isn't the right place for you. So God bless you. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer Connolly, Matthew 20, 18. No, Dina. Oh, did I skip someone? Yep. yep Dina. Sorry, Dina. Pardon me, Dina. <clears throat> Matthew 20, didn't, 17 didn't through 19. Didn't forget you, Dina. Didn't forget you. We got you. We got no, you. No, we would not. Um, here we go. Um... Dina Christian Matthew 20, 17 through 19. And as Yeshua was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief of the priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Do you think there's a reason Yeshua referred to himself in the third person? I feel like there's some significance to this, but I have no idea what it could mean. He could have just as easily said, I will be delivered over and they will condemn me and deliver me and I will be raised on the third day. <clears throat> well, Dina, just reading this now and just pondering your question, some ideas come to mind. I think it has to do with the mystery of who Yeshua really is. And I think he's letting us know that the flesh is going to be delivered, that the flesh, the lamb, is going to be sacrificed, that the lamb will be raised on the third day. But he, the great who he is, is not sacrificed, is not defeated, is not delivered, is not mocked, is not flogged. So it, you understand what I'm getting at? So I think that, that there's a delineation being made. It also fits prophecy. Because when, uh, when Isaiah is being told about the Messiah to come, it doesn't even say, my son is coming, or my servant is coming, or I'm sorry, it doesn't say my son is coming, or I am coming, or any of those things. It says the servant will come, and he will be meek, and he will be flogged, and he will be beaten, and he will be abused. So, Jehovah, in the prophecy to Isaiah, refers to the Messiah, to Yeshua, as just the servant you understand so i i think i think in in sort of talking about himself here in third person uh he's almost like making a break with a little bit of a of a sort of like he's peeking out from behind the costume a little bit if that makes sense does it make sense what i'm saying yeah. mm -hmm. okay well, he called, Gilda says, so he called himself servant. He called himself a lot of things, but my brother's making a point as to say uh, that, that he has also called himself servant and that there might be a, a point to it. There's another passage. Jennifer Connolly talks about it too, so I don't want to, let's read what she has to say before we comment too much more. Uh, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the son of man shall be trayed upon the chief priests and onto the scribes and they shall condemn him to death. Uh, same, same scriptures. And then she says, Struggling between how he references himself, this time he is talking in the third person and repeating it for the third time. In the future, on charge you under, in the future, on charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Matthew twenty six sixty three. Yes, it is as you say, Yeshua replies. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the cloud of heaven, clouds of heaven. 
And he just looking, is he just locking in his crucifixion here with the son of God claim? Sorry, this confuses me. Or is he speaking it into existence by his word? Teachers use these repetition methods, repeating three times to get students to remember things. It's been proven to work. Law he is breaking, Leviticus 24, 15, and thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. Wait, okay. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the law he is breaking. Are you asking, is that the law Yeshua is breaking? Or which who who's breaking Leviticus 24? The children of Israel saying, whosoever curseth his son shall bear his name. Yeah, I'm not really sure what the question is exactly there. If you want to write in the comment live, that'd be great. Um, I think... There's Yeshua does stuff that's kind of weird. <laughs> like he does some stuff that's just weird. And the apostles are all are, are honestly, they're constantly being like, like he's kind of weird, right, guys? And they're like, yeah, hey, he's kind of weird. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Why doesn't he just talk normal? So this question, I think a lot of you know the passage where he answers it, because I know I've talked about it many times in the in my videos and stuff. Um, but Jennifer says they were charging him, so that is why he is using God, not son. I see what you're saying. That's not the crime that they're using against him. They're using, they're accusing him of blasphemy. And they say so, and then they rip, the, the priest rips his, his, his shirt. So um, he says he makes himself equal with God. And then that's actually the thing that they crucify him for, that specific crime is what they they accuse him of uh, so if that's your question uh, uh is that what she's asking is that because i saw you look kind of funny there alex uh, i'm just looking funny because i'm i've lost my place and i'm a little you boy i'm a little confused um you go ahead and i'll i'll reread this comment and try to catch up mentally here okay no worries i'm gonna read sharon lewis roberts next comment then matthew 20 20 through 23 when the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him and her sons kneeling before, okay, she's asking, you know, which will let my son sit at your right and left hand. So Sharon's comment is, when I read these passages about the mother requesting that her sons be placed on the right and left of Yeshua, and he replied, you do not know what you are asking. My perception is that this is a combination of things when he made, when he made statement. I noticed that asking to be on the left is not a good thing, and the Strongs confirmed that his left was related to Greek pagan believing in luck. Then he continued to say, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they replied, we are able. I'm taking this as reference to the cup of suffering that is about to take place for Yeshua, but I'm not sure when they replied if they realized what he actually meant when he said we are able. And then he re he did say in reply, my cup, you shall drink, which I'm perceiving as a message to believers that, yes, you will suffer when you follow me. I'm wondering if this conversation was also a way of sending a message to the body of Christ. I am persuaded, Sharon, that it is 100 percent what you have said. And there is many scriptures where he will go into detail and he will explain this exact concept as you are uh, gathering from this so that's the great thing is as we continue to read he will continue to give greater depth and, and further fuller understanding of what it is he's teaching us so yeah but i i would say you're hitting the nail on the head vicky richards you want to read that one yep um <clears throat> vicky richardson matthew twenty twenty six. it shall not be so among you but whosoever but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This verse comes to mind when I was reading this, John 3.30, He must increase, but I must decrease. We must have more of him in order to become a servant. It's not human nature to want to become a servant. The only way to truly serve is to be filled with his spirit. 
Lindy posted this from Hebrews for Christians, and it's so true. Quote, a paradox of the spiritual life is we must descend to ascend. That's exactly what Christ did. He became the ultimate servant, even unto death for us, and then ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, I, I agree with you about specific, all of it, and specifically about um, the, uh, what did you say here that I really loved? Um, to send to ascend? Yeah, no, the, the little bit before that. Um, oh. We must have more of him in order to become a servant. It's not human nature to want to become a servant. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. and that takes you right, in my mind, that takes me right back to the uh, parable of the laborers. Uh, if if you have an option to get by and not work as a human being, guess what you're going to pick? To get by and not work. I mean, that's just bottom line. That's what you're going to do. And um, the again, this is why them showing up and being willing to work is already not of themselves. It's already for the sake of the guy with the vineyard. And it's, it's an analogy. Um, those that show up and wish to become a servant uh, unto others as Yeshua are actually showing up as an extension of what he's doing. They have his spirit. And anyway, what you say is perfectly right. It's good stuff. Very good stuff. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's John 3.30. A paradox of the spiritual life is we must descend to ascend. I mean, Yeshua does that in every single possible way. I mean, he does it spiritually. He does it physically. He does it regally. Like, he loses his, he he, he destroys his image, right? Like, like, who he is to them, the, you know, king the messiah ben david type of role you know he just he 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 goes down all the way with it and into shoal and gets the souls even so it's like yeah i mean he literally does it's just and and that's that light bulb that turns on yeshua wasn't yeshua because he climbed the mountain and defeated the dragon he defeated the dragon because he was bestowed with the yeshua you know what I mean? He was bestowed with the with the Yahweh in him, Holy Spirit in him. That's why he was able to stomp the serpent's head, you know, and like he's trying to constantly tell us it's I'm I want to give that to you, too. And we keep trying to think of how we can go and conquer. I mean, it's just in our nature. It's it really is. You know, my, as my brother just said here, Alex, it's like, look, if you have the chance to get by, pay your bills and not do whatever without working, you're not going to want to work. There's some of us who, who want to work because we hate being bored out of our minds, but there are a lot of people that would love to just sit and just get the handout. So, you know, there's 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 both, but yeah, it, I, I think he's right. Who's going to want to slave all day, right? So, and uh, you guys get well, what I, I mean by that. And I do believe, I, I do believe that. People who want to work, even let's take just the regular work analogy, who really want to serve others, whether it be uh, relating to being a minister, like Yeshua was talking about, or whether it just be like, hey, I just want to build stuff for people. That's a godly impulse. That is a holy impulse. Mm -hmm. Like it's a servitude. It is doing good. I'm not saying it's a salvation thing. I'm not getting into any of that. I'm just saying, like, you can draw the parallel and say, yeah, that that was, you know, anybody who serves anyone else with a smile and joy and gives them something truly wonderful, they've given them a wonderful thing. And, um, and it is a good thing. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, not to make it really stupid and simple, but like, I think what my brother said, you know, I think what I'm getting at here is that, you know, you, you will find uh, that, that God is made manifest all the time, everywhere among people. Um, I'm saying his, 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 his holiness, the doing of goodness does happen. Um, um, evidence of his goodness are everywhere is what I'm saying. Amen. 
Dina Lyle says, how many of us have been upset for not receiving recognition for something we work hard on or did well? Ah, I've got a Here. whole encyclopedia of, of such things. Here's another thing that's interesting about that sentence. Who could give recognition to Yeshua for who he was or what he was doing? Like, is it, it couldn't even exist because there's nobody who understood the totality of what he was doing. Think about the frustration of that. It's it's not even so much that somebody was like not recognizing him. They even if they tried to recognize him, they were frustrated because they're like, I don't understand. And he would be like. Ah, I've been here so long, you still don't get it. But I think you also understood too that we would never understand the magnitude of what he was doing for us on the cross and in his teachings, right? So yeah, I I, I, I perceive a, a frustration there. That's a, a is an interesting comment. Hallelujah. Jim Hogg says, lessons for me have been ultimately life is about doing for loving others. I am willing to bet this is what the kingdom is like. I'm willing to bet that too. Amen. And good, I, good point. I, the other thing that makes me think of, you know, you imagine a, you know, a school kid, a kindergarten kid, uh, in order for them to learn their ABCs, you got to give them stars and you got to give them funny rewards. You, you know that the reward is nothing. It means nothing that the real gold is in them learning the ABCs. Why? Not because they're going to love it necessarily right then and there while they're learning it, but because one day that knowledge, they will be empowered with it. They will understand how to read and they will get greater things and you will have prepared them for being able to have maybe a conversation with you when they grow up. Yeah, amen. It's the same thing, possibly, have we thought about that? It's the same thing here. The Lord is preparing us to have a conversation and a fellowship with us when we grow up. And when everybody's running around going, but yeah, okay, great, whatever, am I gonna get my gold star? I want a gold star I, fine, I'll learn my, you know, commandments, but I want a gold star at some point. At exactly. some point, while, while they might be cute for a while, and the Lord's very patient, at some point, for the creator of all things, for the, I'm going to repeat that, for the creator of all things, creator, the almighty creator of the universe, to be, to be in his presence and to speak and to have a moment of, he gets me, I get him. <laughs> uh, that's asking for a lot. We need to value that. We need to value to be ready for that rather than I just want my gold star. I don't care. I'll learn, I'll read any book. Does that make sense? Exactly. What I'm saying? That's the difference. That's the difference right there, but absolutely. I'll leave. Yeah. Um, Ricardo, Matthew 20, 24 through 28, 28. I can speak. And when the 10 heard it, they were indignant concerning the two brothers. But Yeshua called them and said, you know that the rulers of the nation exercise dominion over them and they who are great exercise authority over them. However, it shall not be so among you. But whosoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be the chief among you, let him be your servant. And even as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life like a ransom for many. What really hit me is the verse is how much uh, emphasis Yeshua makes by repeating, let him be your servant. We are here to serve, not to be served. What greater task that serve our creator for him to work through us. What greater task that serve our creator for him to work through us that we may help him and work for his kingdom and more coming to him. The good fight, the good race, the most desired words to hear, good and faithful servant. Yes, Ricardo, I love it. This is good. This is a good thing. If I if I may soapbox just a tiny bit more, because it's just coming kind of a little bit more clear. Let's imagine for a moment that the king I like that it's all small. Go ahead. Sorry. What's that? Yeah. I say I like when I lean back. I get, yeah, you get tiny. Yeah. Imagine, imagine for a moment that the king loves certain things, and he loves most above all to bestow incredible riches and blessings upon his subjects. The king invites you to court, 
and you come to court and you just want to be blessed. You just want to get the riches. The king happily gives you the riches and you walk away. That relationship is over. You've received all you can receive from the king. What if instead you come to court, there it is, there's the king with his ridiculous amounts of riches that he's willing to bestow, and you say, no, I don't want those. I want to, to know what it's like to give away everything and to love it as much as you do, king. And that's when the king goes, you figured it out. You figured it out. Come work with me. That's it. That's all I got to say. Stuff, all Good stuff. Say. Good stuff. I love it. Uh, Jennifer Conley, rich man, young man, rich young man. Oh, what? Oh, it's a, okay. She ties it in. Okay. I was like, wait, it's 19. Okay. Uh, but many, so this is, she starts with Matthew 19 to moves to Mark, then jumps back to 20. So roll with us. Uh, but many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. I, I'm swaying. Eye of the needle, narrow gateway into Jerusalem and riders who need to be unloaded in order to pass through. Unload the things of this world. Matthew 20, 27. And who shall, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. The father kingdom is like a merchant who had a supply of merchandise and found a pearl. The merchant was prudent. He sold the merchandise and bought the single pearl for himself. So also with you, seek his treasure that is unfailing, that is enduring, with no moth comes to eat nor worm destroys. Mark 8, 35, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, important additive there, uh, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Labors in the vineyard, Matthew 20, 16. So the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Pharisees types didn't like the teaching that others could inherit the kingdom of God. Jealous, entitled, and self-righteous of the poor, widowed, oppressed. These are the religious leaders. This is it, sorry, new sentence. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? But praise be to Yahweh, his kingdom is his kingdom, his rules. Uh, amen. His kingdom, his rules. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be the chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be mis ministered onto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen, sister. Amen. Awesome. Suzanne Davis, Matthew 20, 26. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whosoever and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. I believe this is to give them more understanding, empathy. If a person has been a servant, he is, has been a slave, they become humbled. They become like Yeshua. Serving others is serving the Lord. When we are serving or giving, we are sharing. That is what brings us together as one unit in the body. And Dina says, Amen. Serving others also allows little room for ego to get out of control. God has always been quick to humble me when I've gotten too big for my boots. He reminds me constantly that everything I am and everything I have is because he has allowed it. No achievement is because of my own doing. And this thought in itself keeps me grounded. Amen. Hallelujah, Dina. Couldn't agree more. Both of you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Every talented human who has achieved wonderful things or been recognized for their talents is absolutely not uh, a person who created themselves. Uh, you know, <laughs> sure, there's diligence, there's hard work, there's discipline, all those things apply, but um, people can be recognized for those things. They, they don't, anyway. My point, my point basically is, is that God is the is sovereign, not just in the macro things. He's literally sovereign on every hair of your head. 
So, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Thank God for that too. Thank God for that too. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Lynn, yeah. Lindy, this may be a weird analogy. It also makes me think of our animal companions, like my Phoebe, which is her bird. I feel like uh, Yahweh shines his light through her onto others. She is not looking for praise. She just blesses as a vessel for Yahweh's love to come through. Also reminds me of Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Amen, sister. Amen. Uh, Therese says Matthew 26, 11. Wait, why 26? Was that a typo? Oh, um, no, this might actually be like a chapter ahead, a few chapters yeah. ahead. Okay. All right, we'll hold um, off on that. Then. Yeah. Dina Christu then, Matthew 20, 32, when Yeshua heard them, he stopped and called, what do you want me to do for you? I love this question. Obviously, Yeshua knew that these men were blind and knew what they wanted, but he still posed the question. What a great reminder to pray and ask for the things we need. This passage also reminded me of Matthew 7, 7. <laughs> ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And James 4, 2, you, number 4, verse 2, uh, you do not have because you do not ask. Yep, amen. Amen, amen. Dina says, I feel the same about my chickens. <laughs> They're blessings. Amen. Uh, original Cecil Bartley, uh, can you please tell me what Bible you're reading from? Well, there's about a hundred something plus people here, and I think everybody reads from a different Bible. But um, the idea of this whole entire Bible read through is uh, reading it in a translation of the original language. I personally lean towards the um, Masoretic, and I prefer the Strong's Concordance to give me a full understanding of the Masoretic. What other people read, it could be the Septuagint, the Vulgate, it could be any translation from the ESV, NAB, NIT, LMNOP, QRS, or TUV. There's really no way of knowing until you get to all the XYZs and uh, you talk to each and every single individual who's a part of this video series, which is a lot of people. So, but uh, me personally, that's that's my answer. I'm a Masoretic based person with a Strong's concordance for translation. So, so well, Alex, yeah, and and the Strong's is most. It, 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 there's an app out there. It, it, this is this is review for everybody else. But um, I'm glad you asked the question, um, um, Cecil. Um, that uh, there's an app out there called Esword. Uh, if there's a King James version that has the, uh, concordance right next to it, you can click, you can tap on, uh, the words themselves and the little numbers next to the words, and you will see the original Hebrew or the original Greek, which really, really, really helps, uh, been having, helping all of us tremendously in, in gaining understanding and really fellowshipping. Amen. Well said, brother. Yep. Yeah. And there's a whole video at Yeshua Network on Facebook. There's a whole video about uh, reading from the Strong's Concordance. So, yeah. And if you guys are seeing me do little weird hand gestures, I bought bananas at the store. And there are these little gnats, like, everywhere in the house. And I'm trying to kill them. So, anyways. Yeah, I'm never buying bananas locally again. I, every time I do, I get these little gnats. And it takes me, like, a month kill them i thought it was like a once or twice thing but i realized third fourth time the exact same thing happens i bring these gnats in so i'm not seeing things or hallucinating there's literally little gnats everywhere around me right now so yeah i think that's what you guys are laughing at because out of nowhere <laughs> after i do that i see the laughy faces <laughs> on the comment section so just nate nate's grabbing the air what's he grabbing what's he reaching out and trying to <laughs> <laughs> so much. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, brother. Read the next one. Ricardo. Oh, wait. Yes. Wait. Oh, wait. We're starting off. Okay. Go. Go do it. It's good. Um, hold on. We got some people trying to give you remedies for your problem here. I, Try... I'm telling you, I've tried everything. I've, <laughs> I've got traps. Apple out. cider vinegar. Have you tried that? I have everything. I have. I have apple cider vinegar. Very I've hard. tried red wine. I've tried nah. the sugar waters and the sodas and all that stuff. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, what works the best, ironically, is um, uh, 
Starbucks coffee. Oh boy. I leave Starbucks. I leave Starbucks coffee in little cups around around the sink, and then I put the traps up above the sink, and then and then I get them. But I don't know still if that's like, I don't know if that's um, a good if that's a good reflection of Starbucks coffee or not. I don't know either, but it works really well. So. Starbucks coffee stronger than alcohol. I don't. Know. I mean, they don't. <laughs> they do go for the wine. Yeah, I use the tape, Jennifer Collins. Yeah, the tape works really good. Yeah. Like pesky little creatures. They're just, they're so small, you can't get them. It's not even that they're quick. They're just so tiny. It's like by the time your hand reaches them, they've already <laughs> traveled their 10,000 miles, right? Matt's <laughs> love Starbucks. I know. What a great commercial. Okay. Yeah. Enough about me right. and my invisible friends who are chasing me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is normal. This is normal. So this is, unfortunately, this is normal. Welcome <laughs> to the most professional Bible read through series ever made. This is how we roll with yeah, Nate's roll. glowing green. <laughs> well, I can't see the green. Well, I guess you can. Yeah, there's a green outline. But it's, it doesn't matter. Hey, okay. we're not in person today. So, you know, this is movie magic on a no budget. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Ricardo. Um, Matthew 20, 29 through 34. Yeshua heals two blind men. men. Uh, here, there is a difference among Gospels about what happened. Small details. Matthew states that two blind men were healed here but by Yeshua touching them. Luke states in Luke 18 that it was only one blind man which Yeshua did not touch, just commanded to be healed. Same as told by Mark in Mark 10, but with a detail added, the blind man's name, Bartimaeus. Uh or Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus. Also, Luke and Mark add that Yeshua told him, Thy faith hath made you whole. The last thing Yeshua says made me realize something. This blind man, or two of them, uh, they did not care about shouting out loud while everybody was there, even telling them to shut up and calm down. But they kept coming and crying out even louder and more, thinking how many times people does this still, uh, and reject the act of praying by considering it useless, or just pray for something once and give up just because of the people around you. Yeah, Ricardo, that's a really good point. It's like uh, King David dancing naked. Okay. God didn't look at that and said, well, you're weird. I don't think I like that. No, quite the opposite. And, and the same thing here. These guys are like screaming, yelling, won't stop. They're not being, they're not allowing people's uh, uncomfortableness and social whatever habits to silence their need to talk to God. Um, because mm. if they have faith in Yeshua, that means they have faith in Yehovah because they understand Yeshua is Messiah, which anyway, you get the point. So, uh, yeah. I think that, uh, I think that that's, I think that's great. I wonder what the... We'll get there. We'll get there in Mark about the name Bartimaeus. I'm sure there's something interesting there. Yes. <laughs> are, you, are you still reading fruit fly go away recipes? <laughs> no. I'm, I, was, I was already... I was reading Ricardo's next comment. So my mind was melting because I'm like, what is he reading? So oh. the whole time my mind was... I couldn't even... I didn't even hear a word you said. So now I'm reading Perfect. it. So I can get caught up. Yeah. So forgive me, guys. So I was like, what? Uh, Nathan's face. Yeah. My face is like, what was Alex reading? I was oh, like, you, oh, you thought I, we were in the next comment. Yeah. I thought it was the next comment. I had oh. it scrolled up so high, it was off of my page. So I was I like, gotcha. what is, where is, how do I, when did this? So yeah. Now I have to read it. Okay. hairspray flamethrower so here's 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 the only thing here's the only thing that's interesting to me about what you wrote ricardo about the differences of the of the scriptures and and i i don't i don't want to say that i know for sure i feel confident in the research i've done prior but that doesn't mean that uh, we don't have tons more we can do i'm not sure it's the same healing of the same people I mean, we also know that Yeshua spit, you know, in the mud and put mud on a guy's eyes and healed his blindness too. I, I think that Yeshua healed probably a lot of blind people. 
I, so I don't think that it's a different, I might be wrong unless it's like the exact same thing where it says the crowd was following him and then it's da, 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 da. but I don't know. I don't think, I think that they might, I don't think all the gospels tell the exact same thing. I do know that there's some gospels where there's a story in one or two, and then there's, you know, a story in all of them, and there's a story in one or two. So I, I don't know if it's the exact same blind situation healing, because we know that there was multiple blind healings. So that, that that's the only thing I wanted to say about that. I don't, I don't think they disagree, but, but I'm open. I'm not saying I know. I'm just throwing it out there that I do remember there being a variety of blind healings, not just this one or the spittle on the, on the mud guy. So uh, yeah, so uh, good comment, though, and thinking how many times people do this still and reject the act of praying, I consider it useless or just pray for something once and give up just because of the people around you. Oh, yeah, that's true. I mean, we've read in the Old Testament about crying out, crying out to the Lord. Uh, it wasn't like, you know uh a well put together nicely nicely dressed musically performed prayer <laughs> it was it was crying out to the lord and that's what these guys were doing you know what i mean yeah i, I mean in the scripture even tells us about how the priest would rip their garment and they would cry out and they would cover themselves in ash and yeah. you know there's all sorts of there's certain levels of repentance that's not like when I say repentance, I don't mean on to sin I'm or, or crying out. Like there's certain levels of anguish, you know? And, and if you think about Egypt, it took like, it wasn't just one generation where things got bad. And then the Lord was like, Oh, 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 something bad is happening to my people. Okay. I'm going to go in and part the ocean and send him a guy named Moses. Like there was generations of unpleasantry. Right. And then there was, two generations for sure minus maybe even the third older generation that walked into the desert with them after the Egypt life, you know, and they, before they ever got into Israel as well. So, you know, I, um, yeah, I don't know. You get my point for sure. So, all right. Kicking off 21. Should we, should we, what should we, how much 21 is there? Oh, there's not that much. All right, well, let's do it. And if there's more to add next week, maybe we'll, Vlad, Let, go ahead. Read. Oh, you read Ricardo's last one, so I'll read this one. Okay. Uh, Matthew twenty-one, one. So we're kicking off twenty-one, new, 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 new chapter here, uh, which is just amazing. Okay, I had to sing it for a second. Uh, Matthew twenty-one, one through eleven, the triumphal entry. Another difference in gospel about some details and timelines. Matthew states that an ass and a colt were brought to him. Mark and Luke only mentions a colt. Uh, Matthew's order of events, Yeshua enters Jerusalem, goes to the temple and takes everyone out. After that, he left Bethany. Uh, Bethany. Uh, next day comes back to Jerusalem and gets hungry. He goes to the fig tree and withers immediately. Yeshua comes back to the temple and his authority is uh, secessioned. Uh, Mark uh, in question, I think questioned Mark's order of events. Yeshua enters Jerusalem, goes to the temple and looks around. It gets dark and Yeshua leaves to Bethany. Next day comes back, gets hungry and curses the fig tree, but nothing happens. Then he goes to the temple and takes everyone out, gets dark and leaves again. Third day comes back and then they see the fig tree all dried. Then Yeshua comes back again into the temple and then is secession about his question authority. question okay okay question about his authority i'm like is that meant to be spelled that way no. um questioned <laughs> questioned yeah question okay about his authority um yeah okay well i it's not really fair to talk about all the other gospels until we read read all the gospels that's the only thing I'm, I'm biting my tongue because i just don't want to talk too far ahead about what the other gospels say when we haven't gotten there yet but will there be differences yes there will be differences <laughs> okay dina you want to read dina no, or i was, you thinking, I, I, you're, I you're was thinking up? upon the differences and like um yeah 
to to me honestly to me those differences are not necessarily consequential just even looking right now without having read ahead and really given it much thought um <laughs> i was waiting for that we're just gonna yeah we're gonna these differences are interesting ricardo and i have a feeling we're gonna get to know what's what's what that's all about um as we continue to read so i'm just gonna leave it at that because i you know i think yeah I think that's what's going to happen. So, Dina, Matthew 21, uh, verse 6. The two disciples did as Yeshua commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. As much as I love donkeys, I wonder why Yeshua chose to ride a donkey and not a horse. I did a bit of research and found it interesting that back in those days, a leader came riding on a horse if he was coming in war, and a donkey to signify peace. Clearly, every detail was well thought out. Yeah. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there was also prophecy too. He was supposed to come riding on a colt. Mm -hmm. Or, I'm sorry, come riding on a donkey. Um, donkey, yeah. Yeah. But but just so everybody understands too, though, colt just means like baby male. So donkeys have colts. Yeah. I know that when I read colt originally, I was thinking he came with a donkey and a horse. Yeah. So he, he came with a donkey and then the donkey's child son. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just just to be clear about the word cult yeah. for those of us who didn't, you know, don't know that kind of thing. I don't know. Whatever. I don't I, know. I need no a reminder. I, I'm looking okay. at I'm looking at the uh Greek here for cult. It's polos. Apparently a primary word a foal or filly. That is specifically a young ass. So it's a young donkey. Yeah, it's a young donkey. So yeah. I'm just saying, like, I think some people think it's a horse. Right. Because that's what we think of a colt. We think of a horse. Right. So yeah. I just wanted to make sure that people realize it's there's a donkey and then there's a baby donkey. That's all. Yeah. yeah. But a male baby donkey. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Ricardo, Matthew 21, 14. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. I know we read a lot about Yeshua healing people, many, many people. This time he got me thinking, how many people lived back then in the area? I kept reading all these sick people broken and hurt with disabilities or disease. Hard for me to read and compare. We are too spoiled by having an Tylenol of painkillers, x-rays and physicians that put our bones back into place and also antibiotics. Just now I realized the scene and situation, this was not pretty time to be alive. See my point? Not at all. Okay, rabbit hole. Ra Ooh, look at that. I almost got that one. This is this is rabbit hole. This is related, but not related. But it's related to what you said, Ricardo. Yeah. So I'm gathering. I'm persuaded that the diseases that we read about in the Old Testament are very specific. The credit to the disease is very specifically explained and i'm persuaded that those things are not something you could have taken an antibiotic for however the diseases post cross may have a relationship to something we're going to read about it later and i'm just going to leave it at that and i think i think that's i hope ricardo just for you buddy that gets oh i got a gnat here what did you do? You, you see? sent me your gnats from across yep. the internet. That's how I work. That's how I roll. Maybe it's just the season of gnats. Maybe it it's not be. the bananas. It, it might be a season thing, actually. Because okay. everything in Tennessee just blooms and you can't stop it. That's true. It does have its seasons. It's actually interesting yeah. to watch the bugs come into season, which bug is what. It do It's true. They do. See? It's gnats, guys. We're not crazy. Well, okay. we might be crazy, but it is gnats. <laughs> uh, Dina Live says, I also remember in previous EBRT, someone mentioned that Donkey had crosses on their back. How cool oh, that? yes. I was wondering what somebody's going to mention that. Uh, yep. Yep. They have, a, they have a very cool black cross along their back. Pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Okay. <laughs> Teleporting gnats. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> Silliest, silliest video series of seriousness ever. This is how we roll, guys. Isn't it? 
How will we do this? Okay. Uh, Sarah <laughs> Peterson. Zoom Matthew. meeting. Zoom meeting in 4D. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Sarah Peterson, Matthew 21, verse 16 and 42. Yeshua says a lot to people when he quotes scripture. The phrase, have you never read? And I've always wondered why he phrases it this way. I assume since he is often talking to the religious leaders, Pharisees, scribes, etc., that they actually have read these things. I'm wondering if this is showing frustration on Yeshua's part. It seems that the Pharisees and others Jewish religious leaders were looking to try and determine if Yeshua was the Messiah or not. They definitely would have done this by looking through the scripture. However, they seem to want to focus on the Messiah and David prophecies and when wanting Yeshua to fulfill those prophecies immediately in their time. I'm thinking that maybe the frustration that Yeshua has here by saying, have you not read the scriptures to them? is trying to point out all the prophecies that he was fulfilling, even though he wasn't fulfilling the things they wanted him to yet. Obviously, Yeshua will come as Messiah ben David later and fulfill all of these prophecies too. But sense the frustration from Yeshua that they are cherry-picking the prophecies and only focusing on what they want to see fulfilled now. And it makes me think about for us today— how many, lie, how many live to see the second coming, or at least some of those end-time prophecies being fulfilled? If we might also do the same thing, we could miss the signs of second coming by focusing on the wrong prophecies, the wrong scriptures, dismiss what Jehovah is doing now and how he's fulfilling things now, because we expect him to only fulfill the things we are personally paying attention to. Anyways, I'm not sure if maybe I am reading too much into this. I don't think you're reading too much into it. You're you're speaking my language. I'm right there with you. I I'll soapbox for a split second before we we move any further in the video. But Alex, you got anything you want to just say before I soapbox for one second? And it'll be a fast one too. By the way, it's not a long one. Go for it. I'm just grinning in delight because I love the comment. So go for it. Yeah, I love I love the comment, Sarah. And I've actually had people, especially when I first, first started my ministry, I had people asking me quite a lot, how come you're not get going into end times? How come you're not covering Revelation? How come you're not going into end times? How come you're not going to Revelation? And I'm like, man, I will get there. You know what I mean? And the thing was, is that there's so many people who want to talk about end times and want to talk about I don't know whether it, 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 it ends up always becoming an argument and it never leads to salvation in, in my experience. Right. And, and I, I, I've never had anybody be like, Oh, I was a non-believer, but somebody came to me and said, look, the Bible says it's the end of the world. And I'm like, Oh, yeah. you know what? I believe I, that, that wasn't how I, I perceive anybody's actually come onto the faith. Right. Because that, that moves people into self-preservation in my in my opinion oh the end of the world is coming the bible has prophecies well guess what so does the quran the quran has bible or quran prophecies that are coming true too right but it's their take on it, right so does that mean that the quran is the true word of god like i'm gonna say no so so my point is to say is that like i don't think i think your comment is much more important in our time than people might realize I I think I I'm grateful. Mm. Choose the words wisely, Danielson. Uh, I am grateful that when I had my NDE, that the Lord had made it clear to me, and the angels had pointed out, focus on the temple. And I had an understanding, and I explained this in my testimonial series on YouTube. You know how this whole ministry started off that testimonial series. I explain it that like I had an understanding that there's going to always appear to be prophecy being fulfilled. Oh, look, they made a contract. Oh, look, they made another contract. Well, it wasn't that contract. Was, oh, look, this person looks like the Antichrist. And I tell you guys, every single year around September, right about now, this, this is the appropriate time, I start getting the end time prophecies coming in, right? Every September, every year since. I can remember. So, and I had people ask me all the time, well, how come you don't cover more end time stuff? And I 
post about the heifers. I've told many people about Jerusalem Temple Institute, which a lot of people now they give me because I can't keep up with it. But they now you guys are the ones posting about the heifers and I'm sharing it because you guys saw the articles before I even did. And the thing is, is like, I'm, I don't really look at end time stuff anymore. To me, I'm totally surrounded by it. And I'm not trying, trying to talk about me. What I'm trying to say is, is that I think that we have two choices. We can spend our time trying to wait for the return of Messiah. And like, like kind of like what I think you're saying, Sarah, and they're, and they're always trying to find like, you know, who is he? When is he? What time is he arriving? What, you know, and then, but like, they're not doing their work. They're not focusing on the work they're supposed to do in their season of why they were born in that time frame. And I see it as like, I already know end times are coming. I already know that when the third temple gets built, we're in it. And I already know that the devil knows he has but a short while. And I don't need to know any more than that. When the temple gets built, it's enough for me, right? Like that's, there's, there's been six contracts for the temples to be built. And that's what starts the seven years. I don't know if you guys know that, but it starts with a contract, uh, an agreement. Uh, and, and so there's been six of them since 1948. And, and so you could have said any one of those was it. And you could have spent you know, your life going seven years from this contract, Yeshua comes back. But it has to be the contract that actually gets the temple built. And so I'm just personally grateful that, you know, the, the Lord had told me, focus on the temple. When you see the temple being built, you know, that's when, you know, and you're, you're in, you're, you're near the time. And, um, and so that, I, I think it's a really important thing that you're mentioning here, because I know that there are, and, and some of, you know, I got to serve with Irvin Baxter, whose ministry was called End Time Ministries. And uh, I think he did the best job of anybody I've seen so far. Of, of breaking it down, not saying he, uh, that I agree with all his translations or depictions or ideas about what it says, but I think he did a, the best job of laying it out. But the thing is, is like, uh, and I'm, I, I said I would soapbox, but here's the thing. You can sit around talking about how it is in times every day for the rest of your life. Or you can acknowledge it's end times and get to the work that you were told to do by the Lord, right? So I perceive that my ministry is me doing the work, hopefully me doing the work because I know it's end times, right? And the work is to go save souls and to educate people and give them a foundation so that when the internet goes out, when the TV goes out, when the cell phones go out, and there's no other way to fellowship except with people in real life, if that should be the reality for all, for a, a lot of the planet, right? How will those people have the stability to, and the, and the inner core strength and, and to not to be tempted? Even the elect shall be deceived, right? Uh-huh. Alex is seeing one. See, I'm not the only one. Just so, sure it's not a mosquito because those mm, are biting yeah, like great, I'll right? say. So I, I hope that my my little soapbox here really uh, helps just to, I don't know, not now you don't have to be in agreement with me. Maybe maybe your job is to check out the news every single day and point out how every single news article is pointing to the fact that we're in end times. I, 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 I wouldn't want what? Oh, you know, no, you know I'm laughing who, because, who does that? well, everybody, <laughs> everybody I know does yeah, that. I know. I do it's, it. Everybody it, does it. It's it's mm, i don't do it but uh you know well, so not everybody everybody's I'm, a strong term oh, oh i okay, like okay. to project a lot so when i say everybody i'm just talking about me That's oh i see i see okay so yeah uh i mean i mean me and you have those conversations too where i'm like okay what did you read to i mean it's it's funny between us, but you get what i'm saying so anyways i may i may i may i just suggest that Unless the Lord is telling you to point out something that is in time, like Sarah, I think, is pointing out very well about the Pharisees in, the, in this time. They were expecting the Messiah, and they were so focused on the expecting of the Messiah, they missed the message of the Messiah, right? And and I think that that could be the case with us in end time. So what my original and, statement was, and they missed, what you're saying they, is far more important than people realize. Yeah, exactly. And they, they missed the the tons and tons and tons of other scriptures describing Yeshua to a T, totally missed it. They were only interested in, okay, okay, day of the Lord, here comes David, beats up everybody we don't like, 
Yeah. The kingdom of God is back. It's all good. The temple's back. It's it's happening. We're rock and rolling. And um yeah. And so there is there is warnings in these prophecies of the end end times about people who are going to be saying things and you'll you'll we'll talk about it as we get there. Things like, "Oh, he must be late" or "Oh, he's not coming because he's not even here now because it's going to get, you know, a little cray cray." So mm -hmm. I think, Sarah, what you're pointing out is perfectly true and is going to be the case that, you know, a lot of people who are even waiting for him might be confused, deceived, and miss the forest for the trees. So that was our last comment from the ones, uh, oh, Ricardo's got one. Well, he's just commenting on the, um, why, why did he keep bringing up the question, did you not read? I, I never actually got to that either, but I'm glad you brought it up. Ricardo, um, the thing about the Jews even today, <laughs> it's really fascinating, actually. I don't know if you guys have, like, really interacted with, like, Orthodox Jews or, like, really heavily studied Bible, Bible studied Jews, but, like, not, I'm not talking about just Jews bloodline. I'm talking about, like, hardcore faith believer, like, living it, Sabbath keeping, like, total everything Jews. When you talk, when you, when you, when you interact with them or start talking to them about Bible, it's, it's always like, they're really good at specifically quoting, right? And like, quote, 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 scripture, 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 you know, uh, it's more important that you sometimes quote than I feel I have understanding, but they will say they have more understanding than the Gentiles, because it's for them to understand, which they're totally not exactly wrong about that. But but the thing is, is that they are missing, in my opinion, a huge portion, not all Jews, I'm just saying in a general idea here, when you meet with them, you get the vibe that they're missing out a lot of the spirit, right? And I don't necessarily mean Holy Spirit, even though that would be the case, but I mean like the essence of what it, what it's saying. And mm -hmm. that's still today. And so when he says, did you not read? It's the best sentence to open up when arguing with a Jew about the Bible. <laughs> There's no better sentence to open up yeah. to get into a debate or an argument or or to try to get, make a point to a Jew. You can't be like, well, I think well, wrong. You have to be like, scripture says blank, blank, blank. And then they're going to be like, okay. And then they'll go, scripture says blank, blank, blank. And then that's it. It's a back and forth between scripture says and the thing that really ticked him off about Yeshua is the fact that he, and they even say in, there's a scripture that explains this, is that he spoke with authority, which means he made conclusions upon what scripture meant. And that, that was something that they were just like, who does this guy think he is? Right? So that was something that really, really like was... I don't know another phrase. He had guts. He had a lot of guts to be telling high ranking, very studied and quotable, quotable people in people to be like, this is what the Bible says. And this is what it means. We're just like, uh, what? But the thing was, is they could never catch him. And that's why they were constantly trying to catch him. They're trying to get things. So when he says, D have you never read? He's he is. I, I believe that he's coming at them with the greatest opening sentence to argue with a Jew is haven't you read in the scripture because you putting them on their heels. It's a debate tactic. If anybody's ever taken debate, when you put somebody on their heels and they move into defense, they're not able to attack because they're defending. Right. So when Yeshua opens up with haven't you read, he's 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 showing that they should have already known the answer. And so they shouldn't be asking the question. So it's a, it's a, it's a tactical thing. And I do believe that it, it is a humbling, like he's humbling them, but then it's also like the best sentence to like come at them with. So um, yeah, it's a really good way. In fact, Christians should use it more often. Haven't you read in scripture where it says if the Lord used it, it's not a bad idea to use it too. And you know, I think the Lord was a little Irish. I gotta be honest. I think he's got a little sass in him. So <laughs> I love 21. Uh, there's uh we're done with the comments, but there's so much to say about 21, I think. No, we'll we'll come back to it. We'll we'll, we'll have to come back to it. We're going to we'll add 21 and 22 to the next week's graphic and then that way you guys can add more cuz there's definitely so, I know I know you got more about 21. The 21 is just filled with crazy wonderfulness. So I want to add one thing and then we can we You can, would. And then we can carry on the conversation next show, next show, next video. 
uh, next EBRT. But um, the one thing I wanted to add so that it doesn't get... I, it's just so cool, was... Um, uh, duh, 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 duh. Oh, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So there's, I'm not going to even, that sentence right there is probably like a whole day to explore. So I'm not going to say that. All I wanted, because uh, I know that's for, that's got to be for next, next CBRT. But all I wanted to remind everybody is when we hit uh, Petros, the rock, upon this rock, I shall build my church. And we admitted in the video, I remember this very clearly, that while we had the notion that Peter's probably not the rock, it's probably Yeshua or the concept that Yeshua is teaching them in the moment. We also said, well, we don't really know. What if Peter really is the rock? And we left it there beautifully, which I'm so proud, and not proud, but I'm happy that that happened. Because once again, the Bible answers itself. We're now talking about the stone being the cornerstone. That is obviously, I believe, that is obviously Yeshua talking about the Messiah coming. Rejected. It becomes the cornerstone, the base of the future of faith. And um, and it also says upon the stone, uh, anybody falling upon it shall be broken, and whomsoever shall it fall on will be ground to powder. So the stone is going to be the super powerful thing. I think right here, uh, we're being told who the rock, who the stone, re what the stone really is, and the word is different too. It's no longer Petra or Petros; it's Lithos, but mm -hmm. it also means stone. So anyway. I just wanted to come back to that real quick because I remember it was left over and I was excited to read this and feel like I received a little bit of an answer. Among other things, there's so much in this chapter. It's just super great. Oh, yeah. We might spend a few EPRTs on 21. Oh, boy. I mean, I'm not trying to predict anything. I'm just trying. It could happen. It could happen. Yeah. We got four or five comments in on it. Four. Four comments in on 21. Yeah, we need we need more comments. So, uh, but yeah, we will cover it next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. And will we add twenty two as well? Mm, probably not. Really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, because when there's, uh, I don't think so. I don't think you guys need uh, basically another week for twenty. Let's just do twenty one. It's gonna be enough. Okay. There'll be enough to talk about to fill up the time slot for 21. So, yeah. Okay. Amen. Amen. You guys are awesome. You've done another great job, another great video. And look at this live testimony from Lynn about the EBRT. She says, live testimony, if I may, I've caught up with you all, the Old Testament readings and videos. I feel up to date with New Testament having participated live for most my man of man has my un man oh man i think you're saying has my understanding exploded and i cannot thank nathan alex and nat uh, nathan alex and all participants enough life changing now i'm learning to live day to day with the holy spirit hallelujah thank you all. oh man oh you made my week month year i don't even know what i love Love that comment. Thank you so yeah. much, Lynn. There it is. That's the power of the Book of Remembrance, y'all. Mm. Yep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you guys for all your work and your dedication. Much appreciated. Be blessed. Be the blessing. And don't forget, tomorrow is... Be the light. It is be the light. So go be the light every day.